Good day, Gary. First of all, thanks for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us where you grew up and where you went to college and what you studied? Sure. Was born in Los Angeles, grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, lived in Urbana-Champaign where I went to the University of Illinois, moved down to Florida to the Sarasota-Tampa Bay area, moved up to Milwaukee, moved back to Florida, and now I've ended up in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. So what did you uh, study when you were at uh, college there at University of Illinois? Yeah, the University of Illinois was in uh, a small department of, called Continuing Education, which was a fancy way of saying performance consulting. Uh, studied with someone named Jim Farmer, who was the performance consultant for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And that's where I learned about what I would call HPT and the whole performance consulting concept. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, what are you doing nowadays? Yeah, nowadays I'm doing performance consulting as I was before um, and have been working with a lot of mid-sized large companies trying to identify areas where they can improve their leadership among their frontline mid-level managers and try to identify gaps and ways to get them connected to their strategic initiatives. Very cool, thank you. Um, can you share with us uh, uh, per perhaps some of the more interesting things that you've worked on over your career? The variety of uh, HPT kinds of projects? Yeah, one of my favorite ones was working with a fi private financial institute. And with this group, what I did was I went in to look at their frontline middle level managers and tried to figure out what their current state is and where it connects to where the executives want them to be. In other words, it was very behavioral based and they wanted the executives, the chief HRO officer, a chief HR officer said, I want people to behave in a particular way that supports our 2022 mission. And I went in and found out that not only did the chief HR officer have an idea about what it was, but his peers had no idea what it was that they were supposed to be doing, but there is a huge disconnect between the senior executives, mid-level managers, and the frontline managers. And there were huge opportunities for them to change the way they did leadership development and some of their talent management processes. So it led to like a 90-page report that addressed all these different areas um, and gave them ways to move forward with developing changes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else you want to share? Uh, anything in the instructional domain? Well, I, I want to drop back to when I was in graduate school and mention something that I thought was critical that, that really triggered the direction that I moved in with performance consulting. And this has to do with Jim Farmer. He's the, he's my, he was my advisor, and like I mentioned, he worked with orthopedic surgeons. And what I learned from him was to go in and not only observe behaviors, but try to get at the thinking behind the behaviors. So here's an example. He went into a surgery as an observer for... Um, to observe a resident who's a medical doctor learning to become an orthopedic surgeon and they were having problems with this guy and during the surgery he was the resident was about to make an ins and, and just about uh, make an ins insertion uh, in incision uh, incision thank you <laughs> yes and the attending just blew up and said no 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 you're doing it wrong you were trying to cut here you need to cut here. And afterwards, Jim Farmer went up to the attending and said, when you pointed out the error of the resident, 
when you were touching the patient, were you just gesturing or doing something else? And I said, oh, no, no, I was feeling where a particular area was, uh, was of the muscle and to make sure that you do the right insertion. The, the patient was obese and you couldn't do the standard insertion and, mm -hmm. and incision. And, and he said, well, why didn't you tell the resident that? Said, oh, he, he just, I didn't think to do that. He'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. So that, the thinking, the cognitive part of it is so important to the behavioral part. Mm -hmm. And that has stuck through me as, with me as I go in and I've worked with different clients and did observations with performers to really try to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So your first exposure to HPT was with uh, Jim Farmer. That's right. And so can you share with us uh, some of your other influences regarding this, uh, other people or articles or books that, as a way to point our audience to some resources that they may want to follow up on? Sure. One of the big influences at that time was uh, with a book by Miriam and Caffarella called Learning in Adulthood. It's now, I think that was the second edition then. Now they've gone through maybe a fifth edition and added another author. What I found influential about that and why I think it's such a valuable book is it looks at the different different uh, categories of learning. I'm not too sure what they call it now, but they talk about cognitive, uh, behavioral, they talk about humanistic, um, the humanist, but then they get into social learning and con cognitive behavioral learning. And it was through examining those different categories that I realized how important it was, again, going back to not only observing the behavior, but getting at the men the mental state, the thinking behind that behavior. And that led me also to a concept called cognitive apprenticeship. So this is a very, one of the best learning techniques that I found, and it's been highly influential in my writing about clinical training, that uh, this approach is a way of combining both modeling the right behavior but articulating the thinking behind that behavior and helping learners develop the mental part as well as the physical part. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Shifting gears here, can we uh, can you share with us a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do? Normally when I set this up I say okay you're at a neighborhood party, there's a new neighbor, they walk up and say Gary what do you do? So what's your short uh, answer to that? Yeah, <laughs> for a neighbor, hell if I know. But no, seriously, what I would say is I work with large corporations, with heads of departments, and I help them figure out why they have gaps between both b b the business and the performance um, among their people. And I work with them to come up with strategies to mitigate those gaps. So it's a lot with change management and helping people understand what it is that they need to do differently. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. It might involve training, it might involve in communications or a variety of other interventions. Thank you. As a lifelong learner, can you share with us what you're currently focused on or what your next focus is for your own learning? Yeah, I'm right now interviewing several human resource business partners. They, in the field, they say HR business partners or HRBPs. And I'm looking, trying to get at, through these interviews, what the current state is. How do they learn what they do? And do they really use a methodology? And if they do, what would it be? That is going to be the foundation for a book I'm writing called HRBP 3.0 which addresses how HRBPs have evolved over the last couple of decades. And this, looking at the current state, is a way of really trying to help organizations realize where they, where they, they tend to be in this field and where they should be in, in their development and what are some of the pitfalls that 
that might stumble um, across a particular department that's trying to develop an HRBP program. What are you finding out so far from these interviews? Yeah, a lot of them are self-taught. They learn by doing. Uh, that's the biggest uh, thing. And, you know, by themselves trying to do it that way, they eventually get to where they're effective. If they had a methodology, if they had a way of doing better questioning to, um, to get at the performance gaps and the business gaps, they'd be doing a lot better. But they, they kind of wing it and haven't really thought about across the board what, what is a methodology that, say, a department of HRBPs, what they should be doing. It's really left to hiring people who are experienced, who have done, done this a long time, and then figure out for themselves how best to do it. And, and the honest truth is they do an okay job. They don't. They may not do as well as if they had a methodology backing up what they're doing, but they get some of the basics, such as the importance of communication and the business acumen, or what I call business intelligence. They, they get that kind of parts of it, but really, I think the weaknesses of not having a methodology is not asking the powerful questions you need to really get at what are the underlying problems that performers face. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shifting gears again, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase? Uh, and maybe it's not even a favorite, maybe it's something that uh, uh, people use and you feel like they're misusing it or it's being misconstrued by others. But uh, our language is uh, an opportunity or a mess, as uh, you might say. So uh, what kind of a performance improvement uh, term or phrase would you like to define for us? Yeah, and this is going to, I'm going to keep to the theme that w about HRBPs and talking about them. And what I, the, the phrase I have is ought is, also known as should is, also known as desi desired state and current state. So this is in our field, we look at gaps, and that's what the the critical part of our field is, the gap between the desired business state versus what's currently happening, and related to that, how people should be performing versus how they currently perform. And that leads to, when you have that as a foundation, that leads to asking critical questions to identify each of those four areas, the business side, the performance side, the should side, the should for both of those, and the is. So one of the most powerful questions is asking a client, what is it that your, your whether it's star performers or our highly effective performers, what is it that they do differently Mo than the typical performer? Most of them will say, I don't know. I, I know they do stuff differently, but I, I don't know what it is, which is your shoe in to say, can I, do you have someone now who's performing the way they should? And can I talk to those people or that person? And there's usually one person that does that. So that, that has helped me in the past with working with sales, um, the sales force and getting them to doing the type of behaviors they should be doing. And it's usually something really small, really simple. And in one case, it improved sales for the following quarter up to 78% increase, just because of learning a couple of things that the star performers or high performers were doing differently than the typical performers. So that's the ought is, should is, mm -hmm. desired, current is, state. Thank you. That uh, yes, exactly. Uh, looking for those exemplars. Ex yeah, as, exactly. As Gilbert yep. called them. Uh, shifting gears again. Um, what I'm looking for in this question is, uh, I'd like to explore some of the people who have influenced you uh, regarding your early practice. So you know, going back to back in the day. So, do you have stories that you can share of people who you know were involved in this HPT or evidence-based practices for performance improvement? Yeah, so I'm going to share two two types of stories. One is around stewardship, and the other is sort of a fun story that um, that was 
uh, a surprise to me when it happened. So I'll save that one for last. I want to talk about people who really practice stewardship. And the first person is Dave Haskett. He's retired now, um, but he was at Johnson Controls, gosh, um, about 20 years ago. And he found me through ISPI, hired me, brought me in, but I didn't realize that he was sort of putting me under his wing. And he ended up introducing to me to people like you in Madison, Wisconsin, when we met over there at a conference. Mm -hmm. He introduced me to Judy Hale and several other of the, I guess I would say, more serious performance consultants in ISPI. Uh, another person that practiced stewardship was Roger Addison. And he's the one who, it was, it was interesting, I, I applied for a, a workshop at ISPI and I was turned down. I couldn't figure out why. What was wrong with my workshop? What was I doing wrong? I said, look, can you guys, you guys make an offer went in your rejection letter to talk to someone. So I want to talk to someone and find out what I did wrong. And they said, okay, we'll put you with Roger Addison. So he got the hard job of having to tell me why they didn't select me, which was they had too many applicants. But I got to know him and he's helped me through my career. He's been always checking in on me. Just how are you doing? What's going on? And when I was laid off, he was the one who connected me with Lowe's because he was doing performance consulting with them. And I don't think I would have gotten in with Lowe's if it wasn't for his recommendation. Uh, his, uh, his just speaking highly of me to the man hiring manager and executive that worked there. So those, those are two people. Um, another person that's helped me along my career that practiced stewardship I, uh, um, is Don Kirky. And he's been a good friend of mine also from the Johnson Controls era. He's, he and I have been good friends and we both live in the Charlotte area. But let me share my fun story. This is, I wanted to introduce you to someone that, that's worth looking up and getting to know. I went to an ISPI conference, I think it was in New York, uh, and I had to take a flight early, like 4 a.m. And I was out in front of the hotel waiting, and this other guy crawls up and says, oh, you know, he's really tired. And I said, where are you headed? He said, I'm going to the airport. I said, you want to share a cab? He said, sure. We got in the cab and drove, it was, took, it was like a 30 minute drive. And the whole way there, we were laughing, joking, and just, I, it was it made it was very uplifting and I found out later on the guy's name was Don Toasty <laughs> and I had no idea who he was until until I saw a, a video with him and said, wait a minute that was the guy that I had the taxi cab ride with mm -hmm. so that's a, a fun story I wanted to share and it was he was a great person great sense of humor but one of the more, after, after I learned who he was, he influenced me with the type of work he's done with the airlines. And I learned a lot from reading his articles um, and his videos too. Mm -hmm. Yes, Don Toasty, so goes, goes back to the early days of uh, NSPI, ISPI, and uh, happens to be Roger Addison's half-brother. So you've been influenced by the, by, by the two of those guys that uh, grew up in the same family. Um, any other stories? Yeah. Um, there, there was... Um, there was a conference I went to. Uh, it was like Training Magazines conference down in um, New Orleans, and I went there with my boss and my boss's boss, and we were trying to. We were building a, a learning and development organization, and we wanted to go there and um, figure, see if we can get some pointers and some uh, insight. And I went there, and I went and. and and observed, uh, went to one session early in the morning, and this guy crawls in. I mean, he was absolutely miserable. He came in and said, I was told to go to this Hilton Hotel. I went to the one on the other side of town, 
and they I didn't know it was the wrong one and he was super grouchy but as soon as he had his slides up as soon as he started talking it was is like he suddenly shifted gears and his passion and his love for performance improvement came out and it was probably the best session I've ever been to and I told my boss I said come on you guys see this guy he's doing another session this afternoon and my boss went in sat in the back row so I sat with him the whole time he was checking his phone and sighing looking around and acting really miserable and then after it was over he turned to me and said Gary that was the best session I've ever been to in my life and I am completely blanking on the guy's name. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I I have just totally I, I just thought of that story and I can't think mm -hmm. of the guy's name now. But it was it was it was great seeing how just someone who's in the field you'd see their passion and mm -hmm. and you know that they've made some serious changes in organizations. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. So we'll find out someday who that uh, who to attribute that to. Um, as a uh, beginning to wrap up, I, what I'd like to ask you for right now are any parting words of wisdom or guidance you might have for our audience, especially people new to the field, whether they're younger or middle aged or older. But for people entering the field, you know, what can you share with them? How would you guide them? Yeah, I would. I would say something, and actually we've talked about this, you and I, and that's how approachable these people are. The people that have been doing this 20, 30, 40 years, uh, you can go up to someone like Roger Addison, you can email any of them, Margo Murray, you can send them a message, and they'll respond, and they will want to spend time, they will want to help you, just because they know you're new in the field, and they've been doing this a long time. Everyone is approachable. So if you see someone who has published something, has uh, gone to a conference where you've seen the person, they're highly approachable. And just go up and say, I'm new to the field. Can I spend some time talking with you? What would you, and, and, ask, and ask them, what, would, what do you think I should be doing? And let them ask you questions to really drill down to how they can best help you. So that, that's the best advice I can give anyone. Gary, excellent advice. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights about uh, HPT, Human Performance Technology. Thanks, Gary. Have a I, great day. I greatly appreciate it.